evening and uh, to those of you joining us from different time zones good afternoon and good morning uh, welcome to this very special session on humanizing healthcare through storytelling on the outset i would like to extend my deep gratitude to the indian association of palliative care for conceptualizing this idea and for inviting palium india to collaborate on it uh, planning it has been an absolutely joyful exercise for all of us so while there are so many different healthcare issues to talk about why did we decide on storytelling well for starters march 20th was world storytelling day so that was as good a reason as any but at a deeper more profound level uh, one of the other reasons was that no matter who we are and uh, no matter where we are in some way or form we are all storytellers or receivers of stories or witnesses to the stories that are unfolding around us and storytelling and humanity have been intertwined from the beginning of time our shared humanity comes from stories being experienced together uh, or transmitted from person to person whether it's down the ages uh, across generations or across um, our contemporary spaces which we co-inhabit with with our friends loved ones and colleagues the transmission of stories have had oral traditions as well as documented ones and that really goes back to the time our ancestors one day decided to carve their stories on the on the rocks of the caves that they lived in and now uh, we are at a time when our stories are recorded in nebulous clouds of unseen and invisible technology which some of us still find quite intimidating but here we are and it's that technology that has made this webinar possible and really the evolution of medicine and healthcare is one of the greatest stories of mankind and today all of us in this gathering have had the privilege of either providing healthcare or of being its recipients the art and science of healing just like storytelling are intricately interwoven with humanity in some circles actually it's believed that civilization in its definition as we know it began with caregiving and how do we know this because of a story that the anthropologist margaret mead once shared with her students and she said that the first sign of civilization was not a clay pot or a weapon but it was a 15000 year old skeleton with a healed femur that had been fractured and the femur which is the longest bone in the body can without modern medicine uh, take over 2 months to heal i'm not a doctor so i'm just going by what i read um but 15000 years ago that was in the case so it could very well have led to that person dying but archaeologists have found that this femur was fully healed even before the person's death and what does that show us it indicates care care from other people who may have jeopardized their own lives in the process they helped reset the bone they nourished the wounded person and possibly even his crutches so it has always been as the saying goes that it really takes a village and while we may be a global village today thanks to the advancements in science and technology we are bound together by our shared stories so welcome to this hour of shared humanity to start things off it is my distinct pleasure to invite the now present matriarch of our beloved palliative care tribe in india dr sushma bhatnagar president of the iapc under whose leadership the story of palliative care in india has drastically evolved welcome ma'am over to you uh thank you smriti thank you very much i'm so happy to be here and uh, i welcome everyone our speakers and uh, our listeners and we know that uh, we are cultured uh, we have values of the our uh, system and uh, everything is all because of our ancestors our grannies those who used, used to tell us stories and today it's a story telling day and i'm very happy that iapc and palam india are jointly presenting to you this webinar on humanizing healthcare through storytelling story tell stories as a tool for transformation through this webinar we aim to highlight the power of human stories to transfer the pro, uh, quality palliative care across various settings each of our panelists has come from different backgrounds and carry rich experience of providing care as practicing palliative care clinicians we are hard pressed for time on several occasion yet we are able to deliver the best care that we are capable of when we really listen the story of our patient and when we are in the opd and when we listen to our patient we understand everything only thing we need to listen them 
and they when we listen to their stories of uh, patient and family and our colleagues and all those our fellow human being here with us we understand things very nicely so traditionally our elders always urge us to share when things were difficult uh we still uh, listen to our elders and they uh, whenever there is a problem and when, whenever we are we are in uh, trouble they immediately they will tell us an story they will tell us an incident and immediately we understand what exactly we should do so as we have said already it is each of these stories that makes us human and listening to the stories behind the statistics is what makes us what make your care truly compassionate i hope you enjoy this session and start actively listening you must be listening your patient because i know that all of those who are attending this session definitely a, a person who has a patience and uh, they listen to other uh, other fellow colleagues their patients their family members so you are already an active listener and after listening to this this session you will start realizing that active listening has a therapeutic effect it really heals and it really makes us understand what is happening to the person and how we should take care of that person so i really i am really really happy smriti and archana and nisha those who have uh, basically all three of them came together and they have started planning and when they started planning i was so happy that um, this day has come and uh, we have a great listener today so smriti we i'll not waste lot of time i will not take lot of time i have too many stories so i will not do i will not say any story but i will listen to everyone i am really waiting to listen to everyone thank you very much thank you smriti thank you thank you thank you ma'am thank you so much really thank you for this opportunity and like i said we had a lot of fun plotting and planning and here we are today um i would also like to just uh, remind the audience uh, some of you might have already read it in our invitation and in our posters that we're inviting you to share your own stories with us uh, even after this webinar closes uh, please try and you know write down stories in 500 words if possible and share it uh, with us on the email that is going to be provided in our chat box uh, the idea of collecting these stories is to some day build a repository of stories from the field of palliative care in india which we can then share with generations to come so um with that uh, i'd like to dive right into our panel uh, panel discussion um, we have today with us some absolutely wonderful people that i'm i'm just absolutely thrilled to uh, to welcome uh, we have dr yogesh jain who is uh, who has an md in pediatrics from aims new delhi um, he's also been a faculty member there but he's really a public health specialist and many of you in the audience today might be familiar with his work uh with Jan Swasthya Sayog and the incredible work that is happening in Chhattisgarh uh under his leadership i'm not going into the details because uh it would take me the better part of this this webinar to just uh just tell you about his different uh, achievements uh there's so there's Dr Yogesh Jain we also have Dr Vidya Vishwanath a dear friend and a senior palliative care physician in the country who um whose work i have admired from a distance and from up close and um we also have joan marston another beloved of the palliative care community based out of south africa thank you for joining us today joan uh who has been part of the international children's palliative care network and co-founder of palchase which as we know now in a world of such crisis uh has a very important role to play and we have chintana gopinath who is uh, somebody who has been closely associated uh, with uh, with us also because she has been a recipient uh, not just of healthcare but also of palliative care in her family and she will share with us her lived experience of how storytelling can be transformative and we have a very special guest here today dr frank brennan who has joined us all the way from uh australia at a very unearthly hour and i can't thank you enough for accommodating us and i will i will tell you a little bit more about frank as we go along so let's get going i would invite our first panelist today dr yogesh chain um yogesh i'm just really going to sorry vidya i'm going to invite vidya vidya is our first panelist today um vidya uh, in addition to being a passionate 
palliative care physician. I know that you're an avid reader. And so often uh, on that uh, WhatsApp group that all of us are in, you're the one who just really enriches it with so much beautiful reading material that you share with us so generously. But I know that you really, uh, you know, uh, the, the heart of storytelling is so important to you. And so what I really want to ask you as someone who looks beyond the disease to the person and really embodies the spirit of palliative care, how has storytelling and you know the telling as well as the receiving of a story altered or shaped your practice of medicine? Can you share with us something that uh, has really stayed with you in that regard? Thank you so much, Smriti, and a very good evening to each one of you. Smriti, thank you for the webinar. Thank you for the introduction. And to each of my fellow panelists, it's a privilege being here. So yes, over the next few minutes, I just thought I would go through a patient's story. And through that story, I would just like to say how, how I have been enriched by palliative care more so than the other way around, which we think often. So let me take you back over the next few minutes to 2016. So in 2016, I was in the OPD. We were in a makeshift cabin at that time because our hospital was very new and palliative care was one of the first OPDs along with medical oncology and gynec oncology to have started. So that was the scenario. It was, it was makeshift cabins that we had as OPDs when we had started in 2015. And in 2016, we had Mukyalama. She just walked through the door and she was lean, she was wiry, she had fire in her eyes, she had a loud voice and she had such a magnificent stride. She walked faster than all of us. And she came there with her daughter and her daughter was a patient with cervical cancer. She was on antiretroviral therapy. She, all her symptoms were over an eight on 10. So that was the burden of distress the daughter was going through. And her symptoms were beyond, really beyond control when she came in. Her disease was progressing rapidly. She had really advanced cervical cancer. And that was how they both came into our OPD. So then this was in 2016. Over the next few months, we, had, we looked after her daughter. And we understood, and then even she understood that she was gradually transitioning into best supportive care because the treatment toxicity was not something she could withstand. Her, her disease was progressing really fast. And with Sorry, I think we may have had some connectivity issues with Vidya's connection. We'll just wait a few minutes. Okay, I think we've lost Vidya, but um, I'm sure when she logs back in, we will we will come back to her. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, I will move on to our next panelist in the interest of time. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Yogesh Jain from Chhattisgarh. And I really want to draw on your very unique experience, Yogesh, uh, working in such a remote part of Chhattisgarh. And uh, I know that you work with some extremely marginalized communities and also in some very challenging settings. Um, and while for us, you know, we read papers and we read articles and journals about uh, work like yours and also your work, uh, living these stories on the ground, uh, I'm sure is a whole other matter. So I'd like to invite you to tell us about the stories you hear in the field that will help us understand your work that has spanned so many years and perhaps a story that was defining for you. Uh, Vidya, I see that you're back. Um, we'll, we'll just come back to you in a few minutes. Yes, all right. Yogesh, please. You're on mute, Yogesh. Yeah, thanks, Priti. Uh, I must say, you know, uh, for me, um, I became a story listener first than a storyteller or uh, 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 someone, you know, who's processing stories because listening is a skill 
we don't learn as physicians, you know, frankly, in this, uh, we have learned, we are taught more to uh, how to speak and how to write, but not so much to listen and active listening certainly takes more time. So to cultivating this skill took me some time while working in the community uh, because I realized that, uh, you know, this is the only way that I could learn how the other half lived, uh, the, 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 the people who are have nots. So in this sense, you know, learning about uh, hunger, learning about soil, learning about environment is something that I, uh, and how people live uh, overall, uh, learned, I learned something over time. So not only to learn, I learned how to talk to the, uh, listen to the words, but also the silences of people, as well as the, the listen to the body and the bodies of their, of the family, as well as their houses and their homes could also speak. So this is something that I, uh, while after while I learned, I also try to teach this to my, to my fellow colleagues uh, as time uh, flew by over the last uh, two decades. And here I would say uh, I'm full of stories now of but of what I've heard, and I would just share in a very quick, rapid fashion about uh, four or four such stories. Um, whereas I remember this man Dhanga Baiga, who was uh, 52 years old when he came to me in 2008 all of 28 kilos, uh, very, very respectful demeanor, but you know, he had a weight of uh, 28 kilos and I was sitting across him with a weight, with my weight of 61 kilos, double his weight, talking to him about tuberculosis, which is a diagnosis that he told me he, he had almost surely. And I confirmed it for him and then started him on uh, therapy that we knew the national program provides. But, and I asked him about what does he eat for food? And he said, he cooks rice, with some salt once a day because his family his uh, children don't support him and something that i learned uh, and how was i to talk about you know nutrition uh, uh, you know diet in a situation with someone who was 28 kilos and had tuberculosis something that i um, and i this led me to i get ideas about how uh, that i proposed to the national uh, government that you know, we should provide food for all tuberculosis patients because, you know, with a BMI of 11, you know, here surviving, which books don't mention that something like this happened. And uh, uh, this, this at least changed my life uh, for a time, for all times to come. When I, and I remember this other woman, uh, one of my health workers, uh, Raj Kumari, in a village, which was, you know, uh, in back of the beyond in, in a forest, in a, in a, a, a bio sanctuary uh, village where she got, came one morning for a training program and she told me that there were four people who had died overnight due to cholera, or most likely cholera in her own village of 300 people. And there were 10 other people who were sick. So we uh, took our vehicle and you know, fetched those people uh, to our health, health center, which had hardly any other uh, inpatient facility, but we provided them uh, intravenous fluids. Uh, and first having diagnosed cholera through a microscopy examination uh, in no time, we started this treatment and this, and I remember the next morning at 4 a.m. I was uh, woken up uh, uh, after a two hour sleep that I had had since 2 a.m. when uh, the husband of one of the patients was shouting that, you know, I've not added any color to the fluids. Uh, you know, uh, the fluids that I was giving, saline fluids that I was giving for this dehydration. And uh, then I had to tell him, you know, that why it was not so necessary, but I learned this lady finally went in to develop a kidney failure, which required dialysis. And uh, the one whose husband uh, was shouting at me, but this health worker of mine who got all these people to this place to save their lives, they lost, we didn't lose any more people uh, among those who 10 who came here to us. Uh, but this, uh, my health worker was, you know, blamed for being a witch because she was told that she probably got the disease to the hospital, uh, to the village because she had started working in health. And this taught me about how witchcraft becomes important as a problem that women health workers face, uh, you know, um, this accusation. But I also learned that the reason why they got uh, cholera in this village was because there was no hand pump which is close in the village. They had to get water from a hand pump three kilometers away and uh, which had broken down. So they started using water from what is called a natural spring in the, uh, or they just made a hole in the, in the river and you know uh, uh, sedimented out water from uh, which was obviously could have water uh, you know fecal metal, materials uh, slipping into this uh, seeping into this water or i remember this woman lachmi lachkumar bai in one of, in a village which is across a river who you know actually uh, who came with a husband because they had a precious child at the fifth month of pregnancy 
and came for every visit for the next, uh, you know, for the next four months to me in a clinic. But when, and I was told her that, you know, when she has, she has to deliver in a hospital because she had had, had a, uh, 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 fetal death, you know, in the first, in the previous pregnancy. And then when she came, uh, when the time came for her labor, they were, the river was in spate on that particular morning. So we sent a vehicle to uh, a four wheel vehicle to one side of the river. And then this lady, you know, she had to wait for an entire night in pain to be able to, for the river to come down, uh, you know, and then she could then be, you know, uh, lugged around uh, the river to get to, into a waiting Jeep to be brought to the hospital. And then she came and delivered a baby, which was alive. But she developed a, a complication called vesico vaginal fistula, where the water, the urine, um, you know, uh, seeps continuously because there's a hole between the bladder and the and the vagina, and that can cause you know um, huge issues for a woman, which was repaired later three month, three month, three years later. And this, you know, this taught me uh, why you know my wife would have, would never have had a problem like this because she would be having a hospital next to at the end of the road but not a woman like her. So this, uh, I have learned about these stories, which I, we, uh, you know, um, we have tried to put them together in a book called Atlas of Rural Health four years ago. And uh, finally, I would say um, uh, in 2021 uh, and 2020, we saw this pandemic uh, hit us so badly. And I felt that there was uh, this, this too shall pass like many other things that are happening. But it was important uh, that I that we captured the stories of the people who suffered this pandemic and bring bring it out together as a as a fight against forgetfulness uh, in a book called COVID nineteen a view from the margins trying to get this view I think and you know Pallium India has been one of the uh, authors in this chapter in this book uh, writing about how palliative care was affected but I think this is a book that uh, would uh, would is also my contribution of stories. Uh, of the pandemic. Uh, thanks for having me about this. Yeah. Thank you so much, Yogesh. I think in just a few short minutes, you have really illustrated for us. Uh, you drew a picture for us, really, because we've uh, listening to you. I, what I'm getting is that you know, um, health is not just you know something for an individual, but it's uh, it's really woven into the fabric and the tapestry of the social and environmental context in which people live and in order to provide that kind of healthcare, we also need to understand the story behind where they live, uh, in what context they exist and uh, what else needs to be done in order for healthcare to be effective. And I think that also harks back to the palliative care uh, view of, you know, relieving um, all serious health related suffering and the idea of total pain, that you can't just relieve pain um, as a single, you know, as a single um, how shall I put it, a symptom, but really look at what uh, what underscores and under, uh, underlies it. Uh, thank you, Yogesh, for that. Um, Vidya, I'm really glad that your technology has, uh, has allowed you to join us again. I know it could be a bane and a boon, and we were just in the middle of listening to your story, so I will request you to please continue. Thank you, Smriti. I hope it stays with me for the next five minutes. <laughs> So uh, here we had Mutya Lama, who actually came to us as a caregiver. And she came to us as a caregiver, knowing fully well that her daughter is not going to recover or live. And then when we went into her history, we realized that she has a husband at home who is a hemiplegic. He's had a stroke. She has lost her older son already. And this is her daughter now, whom she's going to lose. The grandchild, she was also going to lose because the husband was going to take the grandchild away. And yet she walked into our OPD every single time with a large bunch of greens, which used to be wrapped in newspaper, which almost covered her face when she walked in because she had this little plot of land and that was her sustenance. And over the visits, as her daughter was declining, one day I noticed a node in her neck, a swelling in her neck. And she deftly hid it with her sari. But I just probed. I said, can I see that again? And then she gently showed it to me. And then I marched her to my gynec oncologist. I said, you know, look what is happening. Let us see. And then tumbled the story. She said that she was diagnosed with cervical cancer, but then chose to prioritize her daughter's caregiving rather than taking treatment of her own. I mean, that day, 
honestly, it 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 was it was breakdown time, you know, because this woman, with her with her entire history, now has prioritized her daughter's caregiving, and her daughter is dying, and she put aside her own treatment to facilitate that. When we begged her, you know, we said, please come on now, have treatment. She said, I will do it very gently but firmly. She said, I will do it, but only after my daughter dies. And so we waited. It wasn't much time. And then her daughter died. And true to her word, she agreed for treatment. And then came the sorry part, because this woman who was a caregiver to everyone in the family did not have a caregiver to stay with her. We did not have a radiation facility. We had to refer her elsewhere. But that is when we have an NGO, which we've been working with, a non-governmental organization. So we had a volunteer. And it was that volunteer who actually stayed with her through the radiation process helped her get her you know, documentation and helped her take her radiation. And Muthyalama did it. She actually completed her entire radiation, came back to us. And then she was on follow up with us regularly. Her visits would coincide, of course, with her greens and she continued to follow up. But gradually the disease took over. So I'm talking of a time frame between 2016 and 2019. So gradually the disease took over and then her visits to the hospital became really frequent. She developed pyometra, but everything had to be done on an OPD basis because she never had the luxury to be able to be admitted in a nursing home till her husband was alive. And then finally, one day her husband died. And after her husband died, she wanted us to look after her at the hospice. She said, now I will sell my land and I will stay. And then came the relatives because when it came to selling the land, suddenly there was a brother, there was a nephew, and there was a niece and none of them allowed her to stay in the hospice. So finally, I still feel sad that Muktyalama died at home, surrounded by family she never wanted to be with. But this has told me, taught us so many things. The first thing was her resilience. I still wonder, you know, this woman was not educated. She did not have a financial backup. She was going through enormous grief. And she was scared giving like this. But what motivated her to do whatever she did? I, 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 still, I still find it difficult to understand that. She came for all her follow-ups very diligently. And the second thing which actually brings in anger is that in the Western world, we don't see cervical cancer. But every single day in OPDs across India, we see cervical cancer with a morbidity that is beyond, you know, it is an affront to dignity. We see the psychovaginal fistulas, we see wounds, we see pain, we see malodor routinely. And so from Muthyalama's story, I have actually begun trying to club prevention, early detection and palliation, which I think we all should do. I mean, as healthcare physicians, as community workers, you know, prevention, early detection and palliation should start going hand in hand, at least with cervical cancer. So we started doing some amount of opportunistic screening and we always support our preventive oncologist. Another area which I worked on in my research topic in my MSc was the lived experience of the spouses. This again came from this story because the spouses in cervical cancer are largely silent. They are either silent spectators, like how Mukhtalama's husband was, or they are silent deserters, which is more the rule, you know, which is more than more the norm. They just gently slip away and abandon these women. We see it every day, even today. And then when I actually did my MSc research, I realized that there was a lot of what we call as silent suffering invisible suffering. And I don't think any of us really handled this well. We, we hardly ever handle the spouses of cervical cancer. But amidst all the suffering, I still feel for me, Mudalama's story teaches us the essence of what early palliative care is. And I'm so grateful for that because we saw her from the day she came in as a caregiver we followed her through her history as a patient. And all this was only possible because our hospital was very closely integrated with oncology. So we, we kind of started very early 
and we worked with a multidisciplinary team. We had very limited resources, you know, working out of a cabin, working with a very small multidisciplinary team, working with, with an NGO, but we still managed some of that. So that's where I always believe that palliative care is a privilege and always I still reiterate that we get way more than we receive. And I hope that her story will always inspire all of us to do much more. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you so much. Um, it's, if, we allow, if we allow ourselves to really listen to even one patient, what it really opens up for us is not just uh, the stor their story, their story within a community, but really it unveils entire systems and things, the ways in which systems work and you know what needs to be done in order to bridge disparities that exist. So you know, stories are not just confined to that one person we encounter. They really can tell us so much and you just did that with her story. And I, I want to thank you really for highlighting this particular disparity because cervical cancer is not just it's not the story of women, it's a story of intersectionality of so many different, you know, disparate um, inequities that exist and power dynamics that exist as a result of uh, gen gender inequity. And you also touched upon the importance of, you know, looking, looking at what goes on behind that silence, that veil of silence that really clouds it. I want to really thank you for, for this perspective. And uh, I've mentioned this somewhere else that I, I once encountered a lady who said, never forget the face of the person who has changed your practice. And uh, you, really, you really did that for us today. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing the story with us. Um, I'm going to go across now to Chintana, Chintana Gopinath, who uh, I also want to mention is... Um, is, uh, is in recovery mode. So I'm especially grateful that she made it here today. Uh, Chintana, you're not a healthcare worker in the way that your fellow panelists are, but you are engaged in work that is that fundamentally relies on stories uh, being shared. And you've also been a care recipient as well as a family caregiver for somebody with advanced cancer. And uh, you and I have had several conversations. And one of the reasons I really wanted for you to be here today is to share some of those remarkable insights that that I've had the privilege of listening to. Um, so can you can you just share with us, you know, what your experience has been as a care recipient, as a caregiver, and uh, what role stories have played in in your experience? So um, I think um, when it comes to um, can, am I audible? Okay. So when it Great. comes to um, my position as a care recipient, um, it takes me back to when I was in my early 20s and I was diagnosed with um, um, an eye condition called keratoconus. And um, it advanced very rapidly over a year or two, wherein um, having kerat keratoconus is basically um, having uh, blindness, but with some kind of light. So um, I couldn't get clear images of anything that I was looking at. It was like looking at the world through a kaleidoscope and um, which meant that um, I couldn't, um, you know, read. I couldn't uh, see the faces of my loved ones clearly. I couldn't um, be independent. I couldn't look for a job. I couldn't drive. I couldn't do any of the things that one would take for granted uh, for someone in their early 20s. So um, I needed so much help. Uh, you know, to, to move around, to uh, climb stairs, uh, because I, there was no depth percep perception, I would like tumble and fall all the time. And um, then came the part where I needed corneal transplants and in both my eyes, uh, a few months apart from each other. And, um, you know, during the corneal transplant, I needed help for something even as simple as, you know, to wash my hair. And um, I think um, that period put me in touch with um, my vulnerability. So it, it, it was so difficult to ask for help because, you know, you want to do everything yourself. And, um, but then I was dependent on my family and my friends for every little thing. And I think that that's when I understood uh, what it means to be in a position of vulnerability, to be, able, to be needing to ask for help where, uh, you know, you're constantly being told that you need to be this strong, independent kind of person. And um, I think this, this experience came in handy when, 
years later, um, when I had to take care of my mother-in-law when she was in her last stages of cancer. Um, she'd been living with cancer for many years. It was uh, started off as breast cancer, it had, and towards the end, it had metastasized into her other organs. And again, as a very strong, independent woman, um, you know, it was so difficult for her to kind of ask um, ask for help. And uh, I think that experience of what I had been through maybe somewhere helped me to um, to kind of understand what she was going through a little bit better because, um, uh, you know, to be able to um, give her help in a way where it, it, it didn't feel like we were helping her, but it was just something that we were doing to, you know, to enable her to get through her day. And um, I think the power of storytelling um, ties in with my mom-in-law's uh, situation. You know, when the doctors were telling us to do this, uh, you know, treatment and to do that treatment, and uh, she just wanted, uh, wanted simpler things, you know, she said, I want to have a puja in my house, which I haven't had uh, in all these years. And maybe you can convince Santosh, anybody who knows my husband will know that that's her tall ask. So she'd say, can you please convince him that, you know, let's do a puja at home. So I, I did, and we did have this little puja at home for her. And uh, she was, I mean, she was just so happy through the day and, you know, have had a lot of guests over and had food. And I think that story, uh, the stories that, uh, you know, uh, we were able to weave with her towards the end of her life, um, stay with us today, and you know, uh, uh, you know, keep keep us um, keep keep the memories of her warmer in our hearts rather than remembering all the trips to the hospital, the chemo, the radiation, the pain, and all of that that went through. And I think just stepping back from everything and looking at her as, as a person who had little time left and what did she want to do in that little time that she had left and helping her to achieve those little dreams and ambitions that she had. I think um, long after she's gone, those are the stories that um, keep us tied to her, uh, you know, as a person versus, um, you know, all the, all the pain and the suffering and the hospital visits and the bills and all those kind of decisions that we had to take have now uh, faded away in the background and we remember just the stories of her and us and the way with which we related with one another as, as human beings, I think. Thank you, Chintana. Thank you so much for sharing that experience with us. Um, it's, uh, it's really important, I think, for all of us to note that, you know, behind every prescription that we, that, or behind any, every intervention that, uh, that goes out, uh, I mean, this is something that I've learned in palliative care that really understanding, you know, it's one thing to prescribe something, but whether that they have the capacity for that intervention or whether, what that intervention will do to uh, their choices or with, whether they will limit or enhance those choices for them later. Uh, and very importantly, uh, even though, you know, palliative care has been, has come to be associated with end of life care, we know that, you know, it's, it's like, like uh, Vidya said earlier, it should be integrated right from the start because palliative care is also the prevention of suffering. Uh, but it does take on a greater significance sometimes towards the end of life. And um, to me, good palliative care can change the ending of a story in powerful, profound ways, in good ways, like the way you just said. It. There are too many people who suffer long after the person has died because their story ended badly. And it tends to overshadow all the good things that may have come before. So thank you very much, Chintana, for sharing that with us, sharing your mother-in-law with us. And I'm glad that her story had, had a good and peaceful ending. Thank you so much for that. Um, finally, I'm going to go across now to Joan Marston, uh, who is joining us from South Africa. Hello, Joan. Um, I'm so glad you could be with us today. I know that you have a lot going on um, with everything that's happening in Ukraine, and I know how deeply involved you are. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why I think your presence here is so important. Um, and I'd like for you to please speak with us about, you know, the fact that being somebody who works in the humanitarian crisis setting, uh, you witness stories that most people don't. And, um, you know, for some people, it's a blessing not to, not to witness that. But then there are others who, who witness it and 
you know, become agents of change and you're one of those people. Uh, and I know that you've been involved in various settings and most recently now in Ukraine. And amongst all this chaos and tragedy, what role does storytelling play? Thank you, Smriti. And thank you so much for the invitation and Sushma as well. You know, I had the story all worked out in my head. And then I was looking at that wonderful medium of storytelling that brings so much to into each of our worlds. And you know how Facebook brings up a memory from so many years ago. And I think when I started in humanitarian work was 30 years ago when I was working through the AIDS pandemic. And there was a beautiful little boy who came onto our program. He'd been abandoned at birth. They'd called him Tabu, which means happiness, which I think is a wonderful name of hope to give a child. And they called him the surname Matwabing, which is where he was found. And I looked at this, I mean, he was my child. We always say every child is my child. And in Africa, we have a, a beautiful word, Ubuntu, which means a person is a person because of other people. And certainly I'm the person I am today because of, because of this gorgeous child. And he told a story, and that story was actually the theme of which runs through all the work that I've ever done, I think, and especially now in this Ukrainian humanitarian crisis. And really the theme is, will you remember me? Tell my story. And he was this little abandoned child, and when he was four, they discovered he was HIV positive, and that was before we had antiretrovirals. And in his little way, he showed us that as a child, we had to ignore the HIV. We had to look at who he was as a person. And what he wanted more than anything was a family and a home. And so he sort of appointed us as his honorary family. So I was his mom and other people were appointed as his siblings and his grannies and everything. And then we realized what Tabu wanted more than living in a in a children's home was his own home. And that really led to us establishing Sunflower Children's Hospice and opening Sunflower House. And from all we learned from the stories of those children and families led to the establishment of the International Children's Palliative Care Network. And that's when we started working across the world and seeing these children and their families in these humanitarian settings, because Africa is full of humanitarian settings. The world is full of humanitarian settings. And those stories that, that came from, from Tabu, this little boy who couldn't say it in words, his language skills weren't great. Um, will you remember me? If I look at all of these different settings, that story comes through again and again and again. Because when you're faced with, with the the fear of death, which can come at any time. I mean, we know it's there. We know there are dangers. We teach our children, careful when you cross the road. Dangers are everywhere. But when you come into a war setting or um, a setting of a great pandemic, death is suddenly very sudden. And one of those things that we all need is to know that who we've been has actually made an impact on the world today. And certainly when, when the Ukrainian invasion started. Those words came out over and over and over again from my friends who are working in the field of mainly in pediatric palliative care there, but from others that I've got to know through my many times I've been to Ukraine to help them develop children's palliative care. It's please don't forget us. Please tell our stories. And so I just want to very briefly tell you the story of of three of my friends from Ukraine, because I think it's the story of how, um, how palliative care, which was building up so beautifully in that country, it had such champions, these lovely programs were developing, didn't have much access to opiates, but the programs were absolutely gorgeous and people were passionate about what they did. They were contributing, they were working, and this again is the Ubuntu principle where Ukraine was being helped by Russia, by Belarus, um, by Romania. These countries were working together. So the story of the development in all of those countries was this Ubuntu interrelation of the programs. But these three live 
in, Car in Kharkiv, which is in the east and which is one of those cities that has been most attacked by, by the Russian invaders. And they're all three pediatricians. The one is Alina, the other is Andre, and the third is Roman. And if I had to tell these stories from a month ago, I would have told you that Alina, she was this wonderful pediatrician. She had got palliative care integrated for the first time in Ukraine into um, a university level. And she was also working with Roman and with Andre to develop this lovely children's palliative care program, the Hippocratic Center, which was in the children's home, but it, it really had so much beauty in it. It dealt with spiritual care and it was looking after children from the war zone. If I told you about Andre, Andre was the clown. Andre was the one who was always laughing. He's a, cardio a pediatric cardiologist. He had his practice. He worked with the Hippocratic Center. He gave lectures. And because his English was the best of all of them, he was the one who went to America and to Canada to do special courses and took it back to Ukraine. And he was part of this, um, this group. And then Roman, the gentlest, the gentlest, most thoughtful and the leader of pediatric palliative care in Ukraine, who headed up the Hippocratic Center and fought so beautifully that these children got the best possible care. And that was a month ago. Today, if I were to tell you the story, and I get quite emotional <laughs> because it's changed so much, is that Alina, a few days ago, her apartment was hit by rockets and she is now outside of Kharkiv, staying with distant family. Andre has stayed on in Kharkiv and he's been staying in a bomb shelter so that he can help and advise and be there for the children and the adults who need help in his way of, of not leaving, of being present. And Roman, this lovely, gentle pediatrician, he was called up. And Roman has, is wearing an army uniform and carries a gun. And it's totally, I saw a photograph of him yesterday, and you can see it is so totally who he isn't having to be a soldier. But what has got, this got to do with changing, changing our practice? What the Ukrainian situation has really brought to the fore, and I think it's because they had this interactive Ubuntu type um, development of palliative care that so many of us were involved with, is that we thought we knew how to do it. We thought we knew how to do palliative care in humanitarian crises, because yes, we can do it in refugee camps. We can do it in places where there is displacement of people, we can bring in palliative care principles, we can triage and integrate there. But what Ukraine has shown us is that actually we don't know it. We have no idea. And so what we're all doing now is we're scrabbling. We are scrabbling to say, how do we change our practice as a, palliative, as a global palliative care community to integrate what we are learning every day from what is happening in Ukraine? How are we going to integrate it into the future? So this isn't a story that has, this is a story that is part of the way there. Um, it is a story that is going to grow and it is going to develop, but it's really shown our frailty. We were quite complacent. We thought as a palliative care community, hey, we're doing okay. We're talking to WHO. We've got all these different charters and everybody's signing onto it. But this has shown us that our story actually is still very much at the beginning. And unless we learn how to deal with the situations that we're seeing in Ukraine now, we're not going to be able to carry palliative care for, forward as a credible, as a credible um, field. And the way, only way we're going to do it is through the Ubuntu principle, by collaboration, because we can see where there is collaboration where groups are working together, children are being taken out of Ukraine and are going to different parts of the world and are receiving ongoing oncology care. And so the story of Elena and Andre and Roman is, shows us our vulnerability as human beings and how we have to be on our toes because this that happened to them could happen to us 
And we sit here with our own programs, our homes, our families that we don't know in a month's time. So stories, we learn to fairy tales. They have a beginning once upon a time. And at the end, they lived happily ever after. And once upon a time, there was a beautiful country called Ukraine with a wonderful palliative care program. But we haven't got to the lived happily ever after yet. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for that profound sharing. And uh, I'd like to just, you know, take a minute for all of us to remember in our thoughts, uh, Elena, Andre, and Roman, and wherever they are right now, um, I'm sure that 112 people on this call are all sending them love and prayers and good wishes. And I really hope sooner than later, we hear the ending of the story and that it's a happy one. Thank you, June. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm also really glad to have heard the origin story of Sunflower House. Thank you for telling us Taboo's story. Um, so we've now crisscrossed the globe a little bit. Uh, we've gone from very rural, remote Chhattisgarh to less remote, more urban um, Vishakhapatnam. We've gone to Bangalore and to Ukraine with John. And really, I'm just looking at all the different bits and pieces of these stories. There's so much, there's so much to reflect on, like uh, Dr. Satendra has said in the chat box. And I'm thinking of, you know, what Yogesh said about fighting against forgetfulness, which really sort of ties into what Joan said about, will you remember me? And this is what we offer through our stories, remembrance um, and a life witnessed. And I think that is, that is so important. Uh, we, we look past the lethal veil of silence with, with, uh, with their, and of course, how to change the story with, with Chintana. Um, so now, um, I, you know, in response to all of that, Joan, I, I'm just pulling up a little piece from one of my favorite storytellers, uh, apart from all of you, uh, is Neil Gaiman, is, who is somebody I started reading very young. And Neil Gaiman writes about, you know, everything from fantasy to uh, mythology and all of that. And he, there's this one piece by him that says, uh, so like, uh, he says, stories like people and butterflies and songbirds, eggs and human hearts and dreams are also fragile things made up of nothing stronger or more lasting than 26 letters and a handful of punctuation marks. Or they are words on the air composed of sounds and ideas, abstract, invisible, gone once they've been spoken. And what could be more frail than that? But some stories, small, simple ones about setting out on adventures or people doing wonders, tales of miracles and monsters have outlasted all the people who told them. And some of them have outlasted the lands in which they were created. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to now go across to somebody I met. I've only met once. Um, it was at the Gohati conference in 2019, just before the pandemic hit. We had no idea what we had in store for us. And it was actually at a pre-conference workshop on humanitarian crisis. And uh, I remember someone telling me, do you know who that is sitting behind you? I had no idea, I have to say. <laughs> but then I was so curious, I ran up to him and I said, I heard that, you know, you, you, you write stories. And before I went up to him, I actually quickly Googled him and I ended up reading three of his stories online. And uh, for the rest of the conference, I declined all dinner invitations and I stayed in and I just read that whole book cover to cover. Um, it is my privilege and honor to invite now Dr. Frank Brennan, who is uh, a palliative care physician based out of Sydney. And uh, Frank is not just a physician, he's also trained as a lawyer. Um, he has his major clinical interests are in the care of patients with end stage kidney disease and motor neuron disease. Uh, he is a past president of the Australian and New Zealand Society for Palliative Medicine. And um, he has published extensively on, on the human rights dimensions of pain management and palliative care and has published narratives drawn from his work. So I, I have this book that has that I pretty much carry with me everywhere. It's called Standing on the Platform by Frank Brennan. And I highly recommend this book for everybody. Frank, we are delighted to have you. Um, I'm going to hand the mic over to you now. Thank you so much, Maitri. And Look, I've been very, very humbled um, by um, the, the, the the beauty and the insights um, of each of the panellists um, that have presented. Um, what an extraordinary array of stories there. 
And as, as you've quite correctly said, Dimitri, this is this is just so um, deep and rich, isn't it? Um, some years ago, I, I, there was a lecture given and the lecturer talked about palliative care being um, one of the, we are humans working in the most human of enterprises. And it's an interesting expression, isn't it? Because when you tap into that, what that actually means as human beings, yes, there is the remarkable advances in medicine and what medicine and nursing and allied health can do. But as the stories have shown tonight, very uh, today, very, very clearly, it's the richness of the personal circumstances of what people are going through, how possibly people encounter and deal with suffering and sadness, and also the remarkable interactions of each of the storytellers, if you like, each of the panellists with what's going on, Joan with those, her colleagues there in the Ukraine, and each of the other panelists uh, with um, their patients. I love that expression, never forget the face of the person who has changed your practice, because I think that that's a, that's a very striking comment. Um, I won't, uh, in fact, I'll put, I might stop here, but just to say that I would encourage people in the idea, the concept of storytelling, never see that as something that is um, eccentric or uh, unusual, because I think it's it's um, it sits there. And as you commenced with the at the beginning, we are all we're, we're listening to stories all the time. We're observing. If we could if we could come to our observation with the eyes of poets. Or, or great literature, writers and literature, that that's a wonderful sense of, of what is possible there, isn't it? And then allowing the uh, people to speak, allowing to th that to come through, and then thinking carefully about that. And that, that's what one of the things of storytelling is thinking carefully what, what's occurred, what has humbled me, what has inspired me, what are the, um, the, the the internal aspects of those stories that often takes time to process. But look, just I'm just in awe really of the of the beauty and insights that have been shown um, today, and also complete congratulations to you and the other organisers for for this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, just to also uh, continue on from what you were saying. Uh, there is also, in addition to active listening, like Sushma Ma'am was talking about right in the beginning, the idea of generous listening, to listen with a generosity of spirit, uh, which allows us to, or encourages us really to suspend our judgment and suspend all those filters that we receive a story through. Things like, am I agreeing with this person? Do I agree with his worldview? Uh, is he, am I feeling defensive about this? You know, is he accusing the healthcare system of something? So those kind of things, if we're able to suspend that also while actively listening competently, uh, I think that also opens up the story a lot more for us. Uh, we have a question in the chat box, which I'm really just going to open up the floor for any of the panelists to answer, because it's a really important question. Who owns the story? Is it the patient or the provider? And too often, health institutions, medical educators, developed countries, or NGOs see stories as merely a means to collect funding, organize exhibitions, or write books. This reduces stories to commodities when there's so much more. What are the ways to stay on the right side of ethical storytelling? I love that question, and I'm just really going to open up the floor to all of you to jump right in and answer that question. Would anyone like to go? I'd love to st to start by saying I think Frank is the ethicist. You would be the best person to answer that. <laughs> Actually, yeah, why not? Th <laughs> no, th th thank you. Look, I, I think that this is a really interesting question. Who owns the story? To me, it's a it's a complete co ownership, isn't it? The 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 sense of our as human beings, our interactions with another human being or or groups, and how we respond to that. Is so, is so human. So it may be that, that we are the people who will um, speak that or, or, or write that down or tell the story as we've done here. But also within families, of course, those stories are endlessly told 
um, forever. And, and that's a wonderful aspect of how families can, can sit with uh, particularly the memories of, of, of someone, but also the current, the current state of affairs. And we, every time we walk into a room, how are things going? And families will tell that story of what's going on. So to me, I think there's a, a co-ownership, but also from our point of view, a responsibility. Now, our responsibility, of course, is um, to do our best uh, professionally in terms of what we're doing in our caring. But as holders of the storytelling, I think there are responsibilities, truth-telling, not embellishing the story. There is simply no need to have embellished any of the stories we've heard today because they're profoundly, uh, they're profound, aren't they? And there, there's an intensity that already sits there. I think also um, the, the sense of being um, as I said, truth telling, but being true to the dynamics of what's happening, true to how we respond, because we we may be very humble, very moved, very emotional. Um, it, it can be in terms of our response to 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 things, and if we're telling the story, listening to, I, I suppose, telling that part of it as well, that we cannot pretend that we hover above this. Um, um, and and are not part of the of the dynamic as uh, in that. I guess there's issues, of course, as we know, in terms of in the writing down or publication of stories, the etiquette, a strong convention to change the name of the person and make it as hard as, hard as possible, really, to to uh, to identify uh, that person. I think unless you've got the permission of the person, um, but I think that that's. That those sort of elements sit there. Yes, look, you, you can look at um, um, the, the use of stories, which which are uh, you know used by use in fundraising, uh, and that's one thing. Um, I don't see tonight today's um, um, set of stories uh, doing that at all. I think that there's a, a profundity there and a and a great compassion. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. And uh, I just want to go across to uh, Yogesh for a moment, because just, uh, you know, taking off on what the question was, I think the question also ensconced some sort of power dynamics that somehow sometimes play out. I mean, uh, Dr. Satena mentioned the developing world, but it, this kind of um, power dynamic plays out in any sort of hierarchical situation. And uh, we've talked about how sometimes we have to be the voice of the voiceless. Um, and it's, it's a very sticky point for me personally, because I don't think anyone is voiceless. It's just about who gets heard, uh, who gets ignored. And uh, even when we seek consent, has the person understood what they're giving consent for? And I think uh, central to that is the idea of dignity. You know, how do we, how do we, um, I, I wouldn't use the word showcase, but how do we tell this person's story that doesn't affront their, you know, is not an affront on their dignity? Um, and so, Yogesh, coming to, you know, the, the populations that you work with, uh, how do you strike that? Because these are such important stories to hear, but also, I, I'm assuming, again, this is my assumption, perhaps, that, you know, the contexts are so different. How do you work with their stories to, uh, you know, take it outside uh, and really sort of shine a light on these disparities while at the same time maintaining that sense of dignity and um, that uh, the sense of self that, uh, that your patients have. So, um, yeah, I, I would be a little uh, uh, sketchy in my answer, but I would say if you, as long as you maintain the principles uh, underpins of uh, equity, and I said uh, responsibility, as you said, not just a, not a burden, but a responsibility of, you know, of, uh, of when, when you, or whichever, you know, which is, also there in other things, not just uh, story listening and storytelling, um, because you're also part of the story when you when you are you know when you are listening to the uh, to the uh, to whatever one is saying or one is even while you're observing things, and some of these things find their way into uh, into texts, uh, written texts as stories. Some are oral stories, and some are just you know uh, uh, things that you have only you have heard and you have not expressed it in the form of a. Of a, of a written or an oral story. I think those underpins of, uh, of, um, of uh, equity, as well as I said, responsibility, as, as also feeling that, you know, you are, uh, 
this is not a this is not a this is not a charity that you are doing uh, when you are working with the community. It's a it's it's a sense of you know uh, of of justice work, social justice work that you are doing. Uh, uh, I mean, healthcare is deeply political, and I feel that it's a it's a political act providing the right type of healthcare um, as a as a principle of getting social justice. Uh, and I think those would be still guiding uh, uh, the very so-called uh, transactional ideas of you know uh, publishing book stories or uh, you know or uh, so I think uh, that for me does not become a problem as long as the other other underpins have been looked after, and uh, and I think uh, those have not caused uh, any uh, any ethical qualms about. Um, uh, while one while one works and also you know sort of observes and you know records, uh, I would say. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Vidya. Uh, you know you were talking about the 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 silence of uh, especially women with cervical cancer, and we know this that you know the fact that cervical cancer is something that affects women in their reproductive organs. There is this whole other stigma attached to that, and women are very often the last to, to seek healthcare for themselves. Um, with all of this heavy, uh, you know, all of these heavy dynamics weighing down on that person, um, how do you get past the silence? How do you, uh, I know that, you know, uh, like, um, like Dr. Yogesh also had mentioned earlier that you listen to the body, you, you know, you, you read the body, you read the silences. But I'm just wondering where historically women have been silenced. Uh, and may not have the vocabulary to even articulate themselves, even when they are asked for their stories. What can we as healthcare providers then do in a setting like that? Honestly, Smriti, the more we palliate cervical cancer, I feel that we have to prevent it and detect it early so that we don't have to palliate. Because it's, it's really heartbreaking. One woman once told me, she said, I'm good from here to here you know, literally pointing out to the, um, and below that, it's, uh, and I have actually watched women, and I'm sure all of us in palliative care have, watched women just lying down because the lymphedema and the bilateral lymphedema, and that's it, they've lost their mobility. So they're just lying down, and one woman told me, I just have to look at the fan all day. So, uh, you know, it is, it is, each one of these women have their stories. But at least because of palliative care, because we struggle to try and go into the rural areas, try to tell them, give them, uh, you know, help them with medication, these women get heard somewhere. Otherwise, they are just relegated to the background because the husband leaves the house, the children are married early, and there is some relative or somebody around. So we actually empowered another NGO here to make diapers. They're not exactly diapers. They are they are, they are little broad pads, you know, which we use just for the fistulas and for the wounds. And so that was an NGO and that NGO helped us make these kind of diapers so that these women can have access uh, to them at a very, very cheap, you know, rate. I mean, we paid for them and we just distributed it to them or gave it to them. At, so there are ways and means in which, and, and I have actually seen women with the psychovaginal and rectovaginal fistula, if you give them the, the diapers, if you help them, if you give them good pain medication, we've had a patient who stayed with us from 2016 to 2020. And how she came in was very different from when she left the world. She actually started going out. So we have it in us to even empower these women, but it doesn't reach them. That's the tragedy. So the silence is because we don't talk about it. How many of the educated women go for a regular uh, cervical cancer screening in our country? I mean, even among doctors, even among, they don't. So uh, we are talking of silence at every sphere. It's not just the lower socioeconomic strata, but it's also everyone else. We don't do it. So and I, yeah, and and the the larger tragedy is that you know the fact that we have not one, not two, three vaccines available. Uh, it just yeah. tells us a large larger story of how we prioritize uh, healthcare for you know for uh, 
for women and also the uh, the the invisible part of that story is of course that men have a huge role to play it's not a problem yes. for women you know yes. men ha- are as integral to that conversation as ever and uh thank you thank you again for for sharing that um i'm just uh chintana i'm just going to you know just be mindful of time we have another 5 minutes but i want to hear from you you know we in healthcare circles we talk about shared decision making and how important that is but really if you look at what shared decision making is is to involve the patient and their families in their decision making in their choices and in order to do that you really have to listen to a lot more than just their symptoms and you know they 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 about their pain and stuff and i'm wondering uh, about you know any experience that you have had where you've experienced that shared decision making in which you were allowed to tell your side of the story or your mother in law side of the story in that experience so um when it came to my mother in law um you know she she had started to lose um mobility and she had started to lose sensation in her um in her legs so, uh, because the cancer had now spread to the lower part of her spine and when we called the doctor saying you know she's in she she's and it's and it was happening very very rapidly like at night she went to sleep being able to walk herself to the bathroom and come back but in the morning she wasn't able to lift herself up and she needed support so the decline at the end was quite rapid and when we called the doctors they said uh, you need to bring her in you need to bring her in we need to admit her uh, to be able to provide her with uh, you know whatever care that she requires and uh, i remember walking in to tell my mother in law this and she the first thing she did was she resolutely turned um, you know to her side to face the wall and she presented her back to me i think that was her first way of expressing that she did not want to go but um, she turned and there was you know no words coming out of her mouth and i said uh, you know you need to tell us whether you want to go or don't want to go because we really need to take you and she said you know um if the siren comes uh, of of the ambulance comes blaring outside the door the neighbors are all going to i don't know what they're going to think about it i think it's a bad idea so i said okay we can ask the ambulance to come without the siren blaring we can ask them to come quietly so then she says you know um, we are on the first floor and they will not be able to um, carry me i'm quite heavy they won't be able to take me down so i think you know we shouldn't we shouldn't trouble them and i was not able to make any headway with trying to convince her to go to the hospital so i stepped out from the room and i called smriti immediately saying smriti i don't know what to do because the doctors are saying bring her in but she's just making all these excuses and i just don't know what to do and i was so frustrated and smriti said you know just take a step back and understand that if she's making such silly childish um excuses to not want to go to the hospital it it she's very expressly telling you that she wants to be taken care of at home and since the disease is hers the body is hers um she is now being faced with what uh, is the end of her life and she obviously knows it before you do i think you need to respect that and uh then i went oh okay because till then i was like okay i need to get her to the hospital i need to get her to the hospital i need to get her to the hospital and then i was able to step back and look at it from her point of view and because the story was hers and i was just you know i was a caregiver i was an enabler i was um, all of that but the story was hers and i think she had a right above everybody else um to decide how she wanted it to end and i think just taking a step back from you know needing to do things and hustle and all of that and just listening to her i think enabled us to do what she wanted and that was against all odds and you know with 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 a lot of difficulty managed to give her uh, you know end of life care and support at home so she went surrounded by family at home instead of in a hospital bed so yeah so so i think listening to everything that she was saying with her body where she turned away from us to uh, you know all of these silly excuses she was making not to want to go to the hospital i think we were able to change uh, the way her story ended and um, as hard as it was to 
watch her at home, I think we'll, we'll always be grateful that we were able to give her that versus uh, push down what, what the hospitals were asking us to do. Yeah. Thank you, Chintana. Thanks so much. Um, we're, all, we're at the end of our time together, but I just want to take one last question uh, from Mavina, who it's a very important question. Um, healthcare providers, how have each of you been able to keep nurturing yourselves when some of these stories are so heartbreaking? That's another story, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other way. But... <laughs> Sorry, June. By just sharing the pain with others, you know, being being with those who understand. Yeah, I'm thinking of uh, what what Yogesh said, which was so powerful that we we need to remember that even in listening to that story, we become a part of that story. Mm -hmm. um, we are part of every story that we encounter with our patients. Um, I think we could have gone on for a much longer time, but we are at the end of our time and. I just, um, I'm, I'm so grateful for this conversation that took place today. I'm so grateful to each and every one of you who came here, shared your hearts, shared your stories, shared your love with, with all of us. And uh, they're such precious stories. One day, years from now, uh, even the stories that I'm in inviting people once again to share with us, uh, this is a repository of stories that we'd like to hand down. You never know whom your story might help. Um, and... So Frank, I know it's well past 1 a.m. now. <laughs> I cannot thank you enough for making this time. And uh, thank you each and every one of you, our lovely panelists. Thank you, Sushma Ma'am, and everybody at IAPC for making this happen. Thank you also to uh, behind the scenes crew, uh, Archana, Nisha, Gina, Surabhi, Mahesh, and Vishnu. Thank you so very much. Uh, keep your stories coming. With that, I will say good night, good health, and good stories to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Marie Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you, everyone. It's been great. Really has. Thank you. Take care.